Hello and welcome, Life with Matthew here. Today, I'm going to show you every last step you could possibly want to take, that I can think of at least, to take a small 1 liter PC such as this Lenovo M715Q and turn it into the perfect smart home server, complete with Home Assistant, Docker, an MQTT broker, a Z-Wave controller, and a Zigbee controller. And just as a bonus, in the next much, much, much shorter video, I'll show you how to get Plex up and running on the same system using hardware encoding and still have plenty of resources left over to do things like setting up your R containers or a whole home ad blocker and web filtering service like Pihole or my personal go-to, AdGuard Home. In fact, if you want to see how to set up a VPN connection that you can put all of your R and Torrent containers behind as part of that Plex video, let me know down in the comments below. Outside the obvious use of piracy, which I do not endorse, the R software suite is actually extremely useful in organizing your media library for use with Plex or Jellyfin. Now hey, I usually don't say this in my videos, but this one has been such a monumental undertaking from purchasing the M715Q to recording all of this to editing it that I hope you'll forgive me this one time for saying that if you found this video extremely helpful, I sure would appreciate it if you threw me a tip using the tip jar link in the description below. This video has taken me months to put together and is exactly the wrong kind of video according to YouTube analytics, but it's my honest desire to help you and I think that this long form format with all the information from start to finish will be the most useful way of doing this rather than me dripping the information out slowly across several videos. So even though this will absolutely murder watch time, let me beg you to make use of the chapter titles to jump to any area you need more information about. Set the playtime to double speed, jump over sections that cover things you already know, or go to them to depth, like this introduction even. Look, I know I'm going to go into too much detail at some point in this video. After giving you the command to type in, I'm going to go into depth as to what that command does, instead of it just being this mystery box that does magical stuff. If you don't care about that, just jump to the next chapter. After installing a piece of software, I'm going to talk a bit about its basic use. I'm not going to make you an expert on using it in this video, but hopefully it will give you just enough information to get up and running and understand enough to hopefully be able to find out any additional information you need online if you decide you want more information. So if you're sold on using a small form factor PC and you just want to start setting it up, skip ahead to the chapter labeled Proxmox Install. If, however, you want to know why I think you should set up Home Assistant this way and learn more about the M715Q's capabilities, then go ahead and sit tight. First things first, why am I even encouraging you to set up Home Assistant this way? This is admittedly a lot more complicated than having a low-powered PC running Home Assistant and another low-powered PC running any other software I want, or even just one really powerful PC to run everything. The answer is simple. First of all, it's because of how versatile this method is. Even if you want to use two Raspberry Pis instead of the M715Q I'll be using as a demonstration, you can still use this method I'm going over today. Just dedicate one Pi to run Home Assistant and the other Pi to run Docker. You want to run this on a Synology NAS? Great! Set up two virtual machines on it. And same with TrueNAS. After testing out Home Assistant on several different types of systems, I have come to the conclusion that having a machine or virtual machine dedicated to Home Assistant and another machine or virtual machine dedicated to running Docker is hands down the most versatile and powerful way to get your smart home up and running. Second of all, just because it's more complicated doesn't mean it's harder or worse. If we were to set up each piece of software manually, it wouldn't be overly different on how I'm going to show you using Proxmox and Docker containers. And in many ways, it's just a lot easier. You see, in Linux, just like Windows or Mac OS, not every piece of software plays nicely with every other piece of software. A common area you see this is when one software package requires Python 3, but another package requires Python 2. And sometimes it gets even more granular, where different packages require different versions of Python 2 or 3. There are ways to make this work, but it can be messy and hard, and one wrong update can break your fixes, making you do it all over again. So, separating out our packages into unique environments wherever possible is the way to go. But if I were to set up a lot of low-powered PCs so each one was running exactly one piece of software, that's just silly. Not only is it being overly cautious and ignoring what software packages work just fine together, but it would be a tremendous waste of resources and money. 
Even if I could get an endless supply of $35 PCs with power supplies and storage media included, once I had four unique PCs, I would have already spent $100, which is what I spent on this one PC which will run more than four unique things. Plus, other than Home Assistant, what we install are all lightweight packages. Most of the electrical cost for each PC would just be spent on letting the PC idle. This is where virtualization comes in. By using virtual machines, I can dedicate as close as possible to the resources that virtual computer will need to run its software without wastes. But I can take this one step further. Instead of creating an entire virtual computer for each lightweight software package, I can create a single VM to run a software environment called Docker, and then use Docker to create isolated environments that each package can run inside of. If you've never used Docker before, it basically creates a sandbox environment to run quasi-virtual machines in. When you create a Docker container, you download an image that has everything that piece of software needs to run correctly. That means if it needs an SQL database to work, that container already has the database included and has communication set up between the database and the software you want to use. Best of all, unlike a virtual machine that emulates an entire computer and has to have the resources pre-allocated to it, a Docker container uses the host machine's resources on demand, the same way that any other piece of software does. So you don't waste a bunch of resources by over-allocating RAM or CPU cores. The end result is that we're going to maximize the resources of the computer we're using. We'll create a dedicated virtual machine to handle large and complicated software such as Docker or Home Assistant, and then we'll use Docker containers to quickly set up these lightweight packages. To run these virtual machines, I'm going to use the Lenovo ThinkCenter M715Q with the Ryzen 5 Pro processor. And it's very important that if you get the M715Q, you make sure to get it with the Ryzen 5 Pro processor. There is a non-Pro model and some Athlon models as well of the M715Q that just won't be able to match the performance of the Ryzen 5 Pro model. And since you can get the Ryzen 5 Pro model on eBay for around $75 without a hard drive, or around $125 with a 256GB hard drive, it's fairly affordable even if you get the top of the line model of the M715Q. And of course, I say top of the line, but that's a bit of a subjective term for a 4 year old, low powered, small form factor PC. Of course, despite it being almost 4 years old and designed to use low power, the M715Q still boasts a 4 core, 4 thread CPU that runs at 3.2 GHz. It has 3 USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports and 3 USB 2.0 ports. The integrated Vega 11 GPU shares memory with the CPU, so you're not going to be playing anything modern at max graphical settings, but it is more than capable of encoding several H.264 streams in Plex, from my personal testing, and even a couple H.265 10-bit streams. Plus, depending on the optional board your M715Q came with, it may even support three HDMI outputs though you probably need to limit this to 1080p for your display resolution, and we'll be running this several headless after we install Proxmox, so having the ability to connect more than one display doesn't really affect us. Additionally, this computer supports both a built-in 1 gigabit NIC and an 802.11 AC wireless card. The exact model of wireless card varies, but at minimum you'll get Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth 4.0, which will be more than enough for using this PC to flash ties Moto devices or use Tua Cloud Cutter in the future. Opening the M715Q is as easy as unscrewing a single Phillips head screw on the back of the unit and pushing the case forward. Inside you can see the main fan is integrated into the heatsink at the top of the screen, and at the bottom is a hard drive tray for an optional 2.5 inch hard drive. To get to the RAM and the M.2 drive, we'll need to unscrew a single thumb screw holding down the hard drive caddy and gently flip the caddy toward the front of the PC to make sure you don't snap the gray Wi-Fi antenna wire. For my setup, I replaced the two 4 gig sticks of RAM with a single 16 gig stick of RAM that I had lying around. I would feel more comfortable with two 16 gig sticks of RAM for a total of 32 gigabytes of RAM, but honestly this PC isn't going to support a lot of VMs, and 16 gigs is enough to run Home Assistant and Docker with several containers, so the extra 16 gigs of RAM would probably be untouched and therefore be a waste of money. I'm leaving the 256GB M.2 SSD that came with this system in place. 
we're going to install Proxmox onto that SSD and Proxmox will automatically partition the drive into a VM storage partition and an ISO storage partition. If we use a larger SSD, we wouldn't be able to use that extra space as the network share. It would just make those other two partitions larger. And all that extra space would just go unused as this PC probably wouldn't be able to support more than about 256 gigabytes worth of VMs and ISOs anyways. If we want to have additional hard drive space available for things like network storage, it needs to be on a drive separate from what we install Proxmox onto. So I'm also going to add in a 1TB 2.5 inch drive that I can load up with media files for Plex or Jellyfin in the next video. Mounting it was a little confusing to me at first, as if I screwed it down all the way where the caddy instructed, my drive didn't go back far enough to socket into the SATA port. I had to put in the screws loosely and then push the hard drive back after setting the caddy in place. This obviously wasn't my favorite solution to leave it largely loose in there, but even when loosely installed, the screws in the drive kept it from bouncing around vertically at least, though I do wish they screwed down all the way so I wasn't trusting the tightness of the SATA adapter to hold the drive in place horizontally. I'm not sure if this is how it was intended to be installed, or if they were expecting me to have a right angle screwdriver to tighten these screws down the rest of the way. Regardless, with the drive in place, simply screw the hard drive caddy back down with the thumb screw, close the lid, and tighten the screw on the back of the PC to hold the case cover in place. Before we boot up the PC, let's go ahead and download the Proxmox Virtual Environment Installer and flash it to a USB drive. Proxmox is a lightweight operating system that is designed to allow you to create and manage virtual machines. To get it, go to proxmox.com, click on About Proxmox Virtual Environment, and then click on Download. This will bring you to the downloads page for Proxmox. The one we want is the Proxmox VE 8.1 ISO installer, though depending on when you watch this, a newer version is probably out by now. Choose where you want to save the ISO to, and then flash that ISO to a USB stick using your favorite utility. For me, I like using Rufus since it's fairly straightforward to use. In Rufus, all I need to do is select the USB stick I want to flash the ISO to where it says device, then press select to select the ISO file I just downloaded. Rufus will inspect the ISO file and provide any recommendations it thinks are relevant. In this case, it warns me that it's going to use the DD image writing mode. And honestly, this doesn't affect me too much one way or the other, so I just say OK and move forward. Clicking start will give you one last warning that all the data on the selected device will be erased to flash this ISO image. Click on OK when you're absolutely certain you've selected the correct device to begin the process. For me, it took almost exactly one minute to flash the ISO file. Once it's finished, take the USB stick you just flashed out of your PC and insert it into the PC you want to install Proxmox on, then turn the PC on. Since this is the first time I've turned on the M715Q I'm using, I'm going to go into the BIOS settings to make sure it can actually boot from USB and that everything is set correctly for this PC to be used with Proxmox. Plus, when buying a system off eBay, you never know what weird settings they have, so I like to scan through everything and make sure it's what I would personally want. You know, things like making sure the USB ports are actually enabled, or making sure my SATA controller is set to AHCI mode. Stopping by CPU configuration, I'll also make sure IOMMU is set to enabled and not just auto. Enabling IOMMU will allow you to pass entire devices through to a virtual machine and not just do an emulation of that device. It's very useful for if you want to pass through something like an entire graphics card or even a hard drive into the virtual machine. I'm also going to make sure that there are no password requirements to boot or restart the machine, which thankfully there wouldn't. And also thankfully, the BIOS of the system wasn't even password protected, so I didn't have to fool with that. In the security area, I'm going to disable the security chip secure boot so I can install a new operating system on the PC. I'm also going to disable CompuTrace, I just don't like it being on. In the boot sequence area, I'm going to change it to use my Proxmox USB installer instead of the included M.2 drive. Now this computer did come with Windows 10 pre-installed, but <laughs> I personally would never trust a Windows install that came with a computer I bought off eBay, even if I was still going to run Windows on it. I mean, there's no telling what sort of malicious software they could have put on this Windows install. From there, I can save the changes I've made and let the system restart so it will boot up into the Proxmox installer. <laughs> Once in the Proxmox installer, accept the EULA, and on the following screen, make sure the target hard drive is set correctly. 
I want to install this on the 256GB M.2 drive that came with the PC I bought. If you're installing this on a system that can support multiple hard drives, under Options you can expand the file system selection and choose an appropriate ZFS RAID option. The reason for this is Proxmox does suggest installing it in at least a RAID 1 configuration. That's where you have two hard drives acting as a mirror of each other. That way if one fails it will use the other hard drive and let you replace the failed drive. Now, I'm only using a single M.2 drive, so I have to stick with EXT4. It's a bit riskier, but as long as you can make use of proper snapshots for your VMs and backups of your other software packages, you can recover in the event your hard drive dies. Though honestly, it would have probably be smart of me to put a 256GB drive in the 2.5 inch hard drive bay and mirror my installation to that drive. Then, I could use an external USB drive for any media storage I needed, or I could just make use of an external network drive. If you're going to risk it like I'm doing in this video and not do any mirroring, you could create a backup of the entire drive, though it wouldn't be easy. What you'd have to do is mount the M.2 drive into a separate PC, and then make a full disk image of that drive using the DD command in Linux. And finally, you'd want to gzip that image to compress it from the full 256 gigabyte size into only the amount of space used by that image. If you're interested in doing that, I've used a command like this in the past, where if was the path to the drive that I wanted to create an image of. In this case, it was slash dev slash sdb, but you'll need to check it to make sure that's what your M.2 drive mounted as on the system. Then I'd use the pipe command, that's that vertical line, to tell it to take that image and send it to gzip instead of straight to the hard drive. gzip then would strip away all the padding at the end of the image, leaving me just with the compressed file that was the exact size of the space used by that image. Regardless, once you've set up your hard disk as you want it, click on next. Enter in your regional information and click on next. On this next screen, enter in a password and an email, and then click on Next. Now, unfortunately, you do have to include an email address at this point to proceed. It doesn't let you skip that option from what I can tell. On this next screen, it's going to ask you for the network information for this installation. For the management interface, I'm going to select the wired connection, give it a host name of Quarks, because I like naming my stuff with the Star Trek flair, and manually assign it an IP address and gateway, then click Next. On this final summary screen, go ahead and look over the information, and assuming it all looks good, click install to let it install the system. It took about two minutes to install on the M715Q. Once it's done, it's going to automatically reboot, and you can remove the flash drive at this point. Proxmox is what is called a headless server. It will display a text-based terminal, but will not provide any sort of graphical interface on a monitor connected to the server. Instead, Proxmox provides a web interface for you to use to configure everything on Proxmox with a graphical interface. To access the web interface, open a web browser on another machine, and in the URL bar, enter the IP address you just assigned to Proxmox, followed by colon 8006. If you can't remember what IP address you gave Proxmox, it's listed there on the screen when you boot the system. Your web browser will give you a warning that the connection isn't private since the SSL certificate used by default on Proxmox is self-signed. To go ahead and access the web GUI anyway, click on Advanced, then Continue to your IP, Unsafe. To log into Proxmox, enter the username root and the password you just configured when setting up Proxmox. By default, every time you log into Proxmox, it's going to give you this annoying nuisance reminder that you're using a server without a valid subscription. Proxmox allows you to use their software forever without a subscription. You just don't get updates as quickly or access to their support departments. The phrase often used to describe this model is that it is the free as in beer and nuts model, which frankly I've never understood. Beer and nuts aren't free. Maybe this is a saying I would get if I went to more pubs, but whatever. I personally wouldn't mind the notification if it happened once on the first install or even once a quarter, but it's going to nag you every single time you log in and then continue to nag you anytime you do anything that has paid features available even when you aren't using those advanced features. So we're going to disable it. Now if your conscience says that's not adhering to the spirit of the means by which Proxmox offers their software for free, then don't do this. I have no such convictions, so I'm going to nuke it. 
Even if you don't want to nuke the NAC pop-up, you'll still need to use the non-subscription repositories if you aren't paying for a subscription, so be sure to at least follow along with this next bit. To swap out the subscription repositories for the non-subscription repositories, head to the left-hand side of the screen and under Data Center, click on the name of the Proxmox node you're working on. You should only have the one. Once the node is highlighted, select Repositories, then find the entry that says Enterprise and PVE-Enterprise under the Components column. Highlight each one and click on Disable. Then click on Add and select the No Subscription Repository. This will give us the updates from Proxmox that don't require subscription. Click Add one more time and this time select the option that says Seth Quincy No Subscription. This will replace the second default subscription repository with the non-subscription alternative. If you're watching this in the distant future and they moved off of Quincy to whatever name the long-term Debian release that comes next is, the important thing to do here is to select the option that includes Seth and no subscription. After you've swapped out both repositories, click on Updates, then Refresh. You're still going to get the NAG pop-up saying you don't have a valid subscription even though you aren't using a subscription repository, but we'll take care of that in just a minute. Once it's done checking for updates, click on Upgrade to let it upgrade all the packages it found with its updates. Once it's done, it's time to get rid of the NAG pop-up. The easiest way to do this is to remote into the Proxmox server using SSH. On Windows, this is as easy as opening a command prompt window and entering ssh root at followed by the IP address of your Proxmox machine. The first time you connect over SSH, Windows is going to prompt you to confirm the SSH certificate. Hit Y to say yes, then enter the password you use to log into the GUI. At the bash prompt, you're going to need to enter cd space slash usr slash share slash javascript slash proxmox dash widget dash toolkit. Next, enter cp followed by space proxmoxlib.js, another space, proxmoxlib.js.bak. The cp command will create a copy of the file name you enter first and name it the file name you enter second. So we're going to make a copy of proxmoxlib.js and name it proxmoxlib.js.back. And the reason we're doing this is just in case things go horribly wrong, we have the original unaltered file that we can restore from. Next, we're going to need to edit this file. To do so, enter nano followed by proxmoxlib.js. Once it opens up the file, press Ctrl and W to search for the phrase no space valid. It should jump you to a section of code that looks like what I'm showing on screen right now. To disable the nag pop-up, comment out the line ext.msg.show by putting two forward slashes in front of the line, then put void open parentheses open curly bracket, followed by a space in front of the line you just commented out. The end result should be a line that now reads void open parentheses open curly bracket space forward slash forward slash space ext.msg.show open parentheses open curly bracket. With this change made, press Ctrl O to save and then Ctrl X to exit nano. Finally, Type systemctl space restart space pve proxy dot service to restart the proxmox service. Now when you log in or check for updates, there'll be no more nag pop-up. With that out of the way, it's time to go ahead and install Home Assistant. Since we want to use the Home Assistant operating system, or house, we need to download a pre-built image that we can import into proxmox. To do this, go to the Home Assistant website, then click where it says Get Started. Click the top Installation option, then on the right side of the screen, find the option that says Install Home Assistant on Other Systems and click it. Click on the View Tutorial button to take you to the page where you can download the image we need. Select the option labeled KVM slash Proxmox with .qcow2 in parentheses. This will download the image in an .xz format. You'll need a program like 7-zip to unzip this. When the house xz file is done downloading, open it in 7-zip and extract the .qcow2 file. We need to get this file onto Proxmox, but we can't just drag and drop it onto a network share. 
We could put it on a USB stick and copy it over that way, but it's more fun to copy it using SSH. To do this, open a command prompt window and browse to the directory you extracted the .qcow2 file to, then enter scp, followed by a space, then the name of the file you extracted, another space, then root, at symbol, your proxmox server IP address, colon, forward slash, then press enter. So for me, the full command was scp space haos underscore ova dash 11.2.qcow2 space root at 192.168.15.121 colon forward slash. It will prompt you for the password for the root account, and assuming you entered the information correctly, it will destroy a progress bar, of sorts, as it copies the file over. This is going to place the .qcow2 file in the root directory of your Proxmox server. To use this disk image, we're going to create a virtual machine and then attach the image to the newly created VM. To create a new VM, head back to the Proxmox web interface and click on the button that says Create VM. In the pop-up box, give the VM any name you want. Proxmox identifies VMs by their ID number, not their name, which are basically just descriptors there for your convenience anyways. So technically, you can create any number of VMs all with the same name, so long as they have a unique ID number. When you create a new VM, Proxmox will automatically assign it the lowest available ID starting from the number 100. Now you can assign an ID number lower than 100 manually if you want, that's just the number that Proxmox automatically starts from. For the virtual machine name, I'm just going to give it the unimaginative name of HAOS. If you check the advanced box, it will give you a few extra options for configuring your VM. On this first tab, it will let you specify if you want the VM to automatically start when the machine is booted, as well as what order it's supposed to boot in, which can be useful if one VM is dependent on a service in a different VM. We definitely want Home Assistant to start at boot. I mean, there are a few things as aggravating as trying to figure out why nothing in your smart home works just to realize it's because you didn't turn it on. But we can ignore the start and shutdown order, as nothing we'll configure today will fail if it doesn't start in a specified order. On the OS tab, tell it not to use any media for your CD-ROM drive. House requires an unorthodox method of installation. On the System tab, leave the machine type set to the default option of i440fx, but change the BIOS type to OVMF UEFI. This will require you to create a new EFI disk. Click on the drop-down box by EFI Storage and select your local LVM as a location to create the EFI disk on. Uh, don't worry about enabling the Quimu agent for house. Hey, Editor Matt here. I had a section here talking about how there's no point in enabling the Quimu agent since getting to the underlying OS was difficult to install the Quimu agent in the first place. But just for the fun of it, I did check the Quimu agent box and to my surprise, the IP information for this virtual machine was visible in the summary screen of the VM in Proxmox, something that only works if the guest VM has Quimu agent installed. For this KVM build we're about to import, they must have installed the Quimu agent as part of the image, so ignore what I just said and check the Quimu agent box if you you want to. On the disk tab, delete out the existing hard disk labeled SCSI0 or SCSI0. Instead of creating a hard disk and installing house onto it, we're going to import the .qcow2 disk image into our VM after we get done creating the VM. On the CPU, I'm going to give the Home Assistant VM two cores. Now, since the workload of a VM in Proxmox is spread evenly across all available cores, assigning additional cores by default is technically not required. I don't want to dip too deep into the weeds on how Proxmox handles resource utilization, but the basic rule of thumb is to assign a single core, and then if that VM shows that it's using 100% of its CPU, give it a second core to work with. Just make sure to never, under any circumstances, give any VM the full number of cores that your CPU has. Since the Ryzen 5 used by the M715Q has four cores, never ever assign all four cores to a single VM. This can create a situation where your VM is hogging all the resources and preventing Proxmox from using the CPU at all, which will crash your system. For my setup, I'm going to give Home Assistant two CPU cores, which honestly, it's probably one more core than it really needs to be. I just, I can't bring myself to try single core. If you're braver than I am and test out using one core, be sure to let me know how that works out for you in the comments below. On the memory tab, I'm going to give it eight gigabytes of RAM. 
This is the absolute minimum I would recommend, and more importantly, it's the absolute minimum that Home Assistant itself recommends. And even on my personal system, with all the add-ons I've installed and automations I use, Home Assistant tends to hold steady at 7GB of RAM usage, so giving it more RAM wouldn't necessarily give you any additional benefits from what I've seen. This is also why I recommend putting at least 16GB of RAM in your system if you're going to follow this guide. If all you have is 8GB, then Home Assistant will need all of that, leaving nothing for Proxmox or the Docker VM to work with, defeating the entire point of using a system like this. On the Network tab, everything by default is fine. You can just click on Next to proceed to the Confirmation tab. Give it a quick read through to make sure all the settings are correct, deselect the Start After Created box, and then click Finish. Go ahead and keep an eye on the Tasks panel to see when it is done creating the new VM, which should be almost immediate. When it's done, the task panel will set the status to OK, next in line it says VM100 create. Before we start the VM, we need to mount the QCOW2 disk image that we copied over to the Proxmox server. To do this, make sure you have your Proxmox node highlighted in the Proxmox web GUI, then click on the shell option. This will pull up the shell environment without having to SSH into your Proxmox server. It is harder to copy and paste into this terminal, so it's not always useful, but it is fine for importing a disk real quick. So go to the directory you sent your .qcow2 file to. If you're following along with me, this should be your root directory, which you can get to by entering cd space forward slash. Entering the ls command will list the contents of the directory you are currently in, and here we can see the file haos underscore ova 112qcow 2 right here where we would expect it to be. To add this qcow 2 image into our VM, you're going to need to use this command. qm space import disk space the VM ID number that you assigned to the VM you just created space the full path to the image you want to import space the name of the storage pool you want to add the disk drive to, then space dash dash format space qcow2. So by way of an example, for me the full command to enter was qm space import disk space 100 space forward slash haos underscore ova dash 11.2.qcow2 space local dash vm space dash dash format space qcow2. As long as you enter this correctly, once you hit enter, it will show you the progress as it imports your QCOW2 image into the VM you just created. When it is done, it will tell you that it successfully imported the disk as an unused disk to that VM. And that unused part is very important. Just because we added it to the VM doesn't mean our VM is using it yet. To fix this, click on the Home Assistant virtual machine you just created, then go to the hardware area. At the bottom of this hardware list, you will see the newly added unused disk. Double click on the unused disk, then press the button that says add to add it to your VM. Now that it's officially part of the virtual machine, we need to tell the VM to boot from it. Go to the options area of your Home Assistant VM, then double click on the line that says boot order. Currently, it's set to boot from IDE2 first, which is your CD drive. Check the box next to SCSI 0 to enable your drive as a bootable option, then drag it to the top of the list to make the VM boot from that disk first. Then press OK to apply it. We can now boot the VM by going to the console option and clicking on Start Now. Now, it's going to fail booting, but that's OK. We have UEFI boot enabled, but the security keys are not initialized correctly to allow us to boot from this disk because we imported this disk from somewhere else. We need to boot into this VM's BIOS file to fix this discrepancy. To do this, power off the VM by clicking on the down arrow next to shutdown and selecting the option that says stop, and then press yes to confirm the stop command. Once it's off, we'll tell Proxmox to start it again by clicking on Start Now and then quickly pressing Escape over and over again to enter the OVMF menu. Under the Device Manager option, select the Secure Boot Configuration option and then disable the Attempt Secure Boot option. Press F10 to save the changes and then press Y to confirm the save. Press Escape to return to the OVMF main menu, then select the Reset option to apply the changes you've made. Now Home Assistant will automatically boot correctly and we'll be able to access the Home Assistant web GUI once it's done booting. To access it, 
Make a note of the IP address it displays on your screen, and then, in your web browser of choice, go to that IP address followed by colon 8123. Once you do this, you'll see it's going through the first time boot setup. It says it can take 20 minutes, but on the M715Q, it took me about three minutes to get through this process. I'm going to assume this is the first time you've installed Home Assistant, so we'll quickly walk through the first time setup together. Start by clicking on Create My Smart Home to get started. It will walk you through creating a user and password to access Home Assistant either through Web GUI or on their Android or iOS app. Then, enter your home address if you feel like sharing that location, click on Next, and input your country. Which, honestly, I think could have been auto-filled based on the address you just entered, but c'est la vie. Then, choose what kind of data you're okay with sharing with Home Assistant. One thing I really like about Home Assistant is that all of these are off by default, and they require you to opt in to sharing your data, instead of being on by default and require you to opt out of sharing. Now personally, I don't mind sharing basic analytics with them, but I tend to leave the rest of the options off. Click Next and Home Assistant will notify you of any devices already on your home network it can communicate with. Click on Finish to finish the first time setup and enter Home Assistant. It will automatically create your default dashboard based on anything it found, but you'll be able to customize this later on to your heart's content. If you go to Settings, then Devices and Services, it will show more devices it found that require additional steps to configure and integrate into Home Assistant and let you add any additional integrations you want. You can go ahead and play around with setting up some of this stuff at this point if you want. And if there's any device Home Assistant discovered that you don't want as part of your smart home, you can press Ignore to have it go away from your Devices and Services area. You can always go back in and manually add them in later, so you don't need to worry about pressing Ignore on anything at this point. If you go back to Settings, and this time click on Add-ons, this will take you to the Add-ons area where you can install Home Assistant add-ons. Remember, the add-ons are Docker containers that contain all the software required to run some services such as Z-Wave or Zigbee controllers or an MQTT broker. There's nothing wrong with using the add-ons provided by Home Assistant, but I personally like using Docker containers that I install separate from Home Assistant to install a different Zigbee and Z-Wave coordinator, and we'll be showing you how to do the same. If you do plan on using Home Assistant add-ons as your Zigbee or Z-Wave coordinator, you will need to pass the appropriate USB stick into the Home Assistant virtual machine from the Proxmox Web GUI. I'll show you how to do that in the Zigbee and Z-Wave setup sections, so be sure to skim through there to see it if you need some help. Returning to Proxmox and looking at the summary of the host machine, you can see that so far with just Home Assistant running, we're using 8 out of the 16 gigabytes of RAM we've installed to this system. 6.3 gigabytes of hard drive space and are using less than 2% of the available CPU. So you can see that this PC has a lot more power to spare for additional VMs. In fact, the only reason we're using that much RAM is because Proxmox is allocating 100% of the 8 gigabytes we've assigned to the Home Assistant VM and not necessarily because Home Assistant is using all 8 gigabytes of RAM at this very moment. With Home Assistant set up, it's now time to get a VM set up for Docker. For our Docker VM, I'm going to use Ubuntu Server, though you can just as easily use any other Linux distro that you're comfortable with. If you do select a different distro, just make sure you get the headless server version of that distro, like I'm going to show you, so you're not wasting resources on a GUI you'll never use. To get Ubuntu Server, head to the Ubuntu's website download page, then click Download Ubuntu Server. When it's done downloading the Ubuntu Server ISO, we'll need to put it on the Proxmox server so we can use it for configuring our VMs. However, we'll need to use a different method than we used to get the house image onto Proxmox, since we're going to actually install an OS onto a VM from scratch this time instead of using a pre-built image. To upload the ISO to Proxmox, go back to your web interface for Proxmox, then under your Proxmox node, select the entry labeled Local. This is a partition on the local hard drive and is used for storing container templates, backups, and ISO files. We want to upload an ISO file, so click on ISO Images, then click on Upload. It will pop up a window to let you browse for the ISO image you want to upload. Click on Select File, find the Ubuntu Server ISO you just downloaded, then click Open and Upload to upload the ISO file. When it's done uploading the ISO file to Proxmox, we're ready to create a VM using it. 
To create a new VM, click on the Create VM button in the upper right hand corner of your Proxmox web interface. Just like the house VM, it's going to go on the only node we have for Proxmox, and we'll let it take the next available VM ID, which for me was 101. For a name, I'm going to call it Docker and check the box telling it to start at boot. If you don't see the start at boot option, make sure you have the advanced box checked. On the OS tab, we're going to use the Ubuntu ISO we just downloaded to Proxmox to install our OS in the VM. We uploaded it to the local storage partition, so just click on the down arrow for the ISO image drop-down menu, and we'll see a list of all the ISO files we've uploaded. Which, unless you've been doing something on your own, is just the one Ubuntu server ISO. Select the ISO and press Next. On the System tab, you can leave everything in its default state. I'm going to check the Quimu agent box and install the agent to my guest OS after it's up and running, because I like the extra little integrations it provides. Like displaying the IP information from the Proxmox web GUI. It's not required, but I like to include it wherever I can. On the Disks tab, you can leave everything as is. Since we're not importing a drive into the VM this time, but creating this VM entirely from scratch, we definitely do not want to delete out the disk drive. 32GB should be plenty of space to hold all of our Docker containers, but you can increase this if you have space to spare, and you plan on setting up a lot of containers, or installing a container that will need access to a lot of storage space on the host file system. On the CPU tab, I'm going to give this VM one more core to work with for a total of two cores, but again, I'm not 100% convinced that this is required. I understand the theory behind how Proxmox does load balancing across the cores, but I just can't bring myself to give a VM a single core to work with. On the memory tab, I'm going to leave it with the default 2GB of RAM. I could bump this up to 4GB and still have some leftover RAM for another VM, but one of the great things about Docker is how lightweight its containers are. On my personal server, I have 13 containers running, but it only uses just shy of 4GB of RAM. We're only going to set up 3 containers, so 2GB should be just fine for us. And the great thing about VMs is if we end up undersizing any of our resources, we can come back and adjust things so they have more resources to work with. There's nothing we need to change on the Network tab, so just click Next. Review the information on the Confirmation tab and make sure to click on Start After Created this time before clicking Finish to create the VM. Once the pop-up goes away, click on the newly created VM on the left-hand side of the screen, then select Console so we can walk through the installation process. If you open the console quickly enough, Grub will still be waiting for you to make a decision. You can press enter on the try or install Ubuntu server option to save time, or just let it time out and it will automatically select this option for you. Once the live environment is loaded, select your appropriate language. For me, that's English. On the next screen, I'm going to let it update to the new installer since it's available and wait for it to update. Once the installer is updated, it will ask you to confirm your keyboard layout. The default option is correct for me, so I'm just going to press Enter to select Done. I don't need the full version of Ubuntu installed since I'll only be using this for Docker, so I'm going to tell it to install Ubuntu Server Minimized. For any additional piece of software I require, I'll install it manually as the need arises. I don't need to let it search for any additional drivers, it has everything it needs already to run as a virtual machine, so I'm just going to select Done. On the next screen, wait just a moment to let it get an IP address so it can update packages as you install Ubuntu, and then click on Done. Of course, this assumes you HAVE it connected up to the internet in the first place. If it doesn't have internet access, no amount of waiting will do anything, so you can select Continue Without Network. I don't use a proxy address, so I'll click Done to advance to the next screen. The default mirror is fine by me, so I'll again select Done to advance to the next screen. I'm going to let the guest operating system use all the disk I've created for this virtual machine, so there's nothing to change on this screen. Just select Done and select Done on the next screen as well to confirm the partitions Ubuntu automatically created based on our responses and select Continue on the pop-up box to confirm you're ready to format your drive. While the drive is formatting, go ahead and enter any name you feel like along with the server's name and a username and password so that you'll have access to the server. I'm going to give it the name Quarks Docker just so I can easily find it in my DHCP server since I already have another Docker virtual machine on my network that I named Docker, but make sure to name it something that makes sense to you. On the next screen, I'm going to leave Skip for now selected because I don't pay for Ubuntu Pro. On the following screen, make sure that the Install Open SSH server is selected as we'll be logging in over SSH to make setting up our Docker containers a lot easier. Then select Done to advance. This screen will give you the option to install featured software packages using Snap. 
Docker is one of the packages you can choose to install, but my personal experience is just that it works better for me to install Docker myself through apt rather than using the feature snapped option here. I don't know why it just does. So if you're going to be like me and install it manually, scroll down to done to advance to the next screen. With that, Ubuntu will finish installing and, provided you have it connected to the internet, will update those installed packages. It'll actually tell you that the installation is complete even while it's in the process of updating packages. You can tell when the updates are done as the option under View Full Log will change from Cancel Update and Reboot to just Reboot Now. Go ahead and select Reboot Now to let the installer finish. You'll see that it fails to unmount the ISO, which is expected. The guest operating system can't control Proxmox settings. You'll need to go to the Hardware tab on the left-hand side of the console window, then double-click the CD DVD drive option. In the pop-up window that opens, change the option to Do Not Use Any Media, then press OK. This will immediately unmount the ISO so we can return to the console tab where it will detect that the CD has been removed and proceed with rebooting the system. Once it's finished rebooting, you could log in with the username and password you just configured on this console window, but we're going to jump over to a command prompt so we can log in over SSH to make copy and pasting some commands a lot easier as a web GUI doesn't like it when you press Ctrl C and Ctrl V in Windows. Once logged into the system, the first thing I like to do is run a sudo apt update followed by sudo apt upgrade so it can install any updated packages that, for whatever reason, the installer didn't update. If prompted for which services you want to restart, you can enter the none of the above option, which for me was 10, as we'll do a restart later on when we're ready for it. At this point, there are several packages I want to install to make my life easier and as a prerequisite for installing Docker. To do this, enter sudo apt install dialog puimu guest agent nano ca certificates curl gnu pg, then press enter. Now, most of these are prerequisites to run Docker, but for the rest, here's a quick explanation of what they do. Dialog is a package that lets you create dialog boxes in the bash prompt. Quimu guest agent is exactly what it says. It's the package you install inside the guest VM that works with the guest agent option in Proxmox to provide a better integration between the host system and the guest VMs. Nano is a text editor we can use from the bash prompt. If you prefer to use a different text editor, such as V, be sure to install that in place of Nano. With the basic housekeeping things done, it's time to go through the process of installing Docker by adding Docker's repository to Ubuntu and installing it through apt. Now I'm not going to read these commands out loud, as it would be easy to misread something, but the commands are in the description of the video and I'll put them on the screen so you can see them yourself. And they come from Docker's own website, so you can cross-reference my instructions against their own website if you prefer. Regardless, the first step is to make sure the keyring directory exists using this command. Next, we'll download the OpenPGP signing key for Docker so we can download packages from Docker's repository with this command. Use this command to change the file permissions for the GPG file we just downloaded. And finally, enter this entire command to add the Docker repository to the app sources list. With Docker's repository set up, Run sudo apt update so it can pull the software list from the Docker repository we just added. Then run sudo apt install docker-ce docker-ce-cli containered.io docker-buildx-plugin docker-compose-plugin then press enter to install Docker and its related packages. Now one caveat about this method while it's installing. I noticed for some reason when I used this method to add Docker's repository to app, sometime later when I went to check for updates, the Docker repository was no longer listed. It was an easy fix to add it back in, but it's weird that it was removed and if this happened frequently, it's a nuisance to add it back in every time you need to check for a new version of Docker and its components. So I'm not sure if this is a one-time glitch for me, or if the issue was that the signed GPG file expired, and with it expired, it wasn't able to check anymore. Either way, with Docker installed, I'm going to set up a Docker group to run my Docker containers, rather than running Docker using the root group or our own users group. It's a minor thing, but it's slightly more secure in my opinion, so it's worth it to me. To create a Docker group, enter sudo 
Group Add, Docker. For me, this group was created when I installed Docker apparently, so it won't create it a second time. I still like to run the command to explicitly know this group exists before proceeding. Next, I'm going to make sure that the Docker group has group ownership over the Docker process by entering sudo chgrp docker slash var slash run slash docker dot sock. And since I want to be able to start, stop, and create Docker containers, I'm going to add my own user to the Docker group by entering sudo user mod dash a dash capital G docker followed by the username you created, which in my case was Matthew. With that, Docker is fully set up. Go ahead and reboot the system by entering sudo reboot so we can start installing containers on our system. The first Docker container I want to install is Portainer. I use Portainer to provide a web interface for creating and maintaining my Docker containers. It's an optional step for anyone comfortable with Docker, but one I personally like anyways. Before creating the Portainer container, I need to set up the folder structure I'm going to use to hold all the persistent files for my Docker containers. To do this, I'll type in sudo make dir dash p slash docker slash portainer. The dash p attribute tells make dir to create the final subdirectory, in this case a folder named portainer, along with any missing directory required in the folder path as well which in this case is just a folder named docker in the root directory. If I do an ls command at this point to show all the directories in my root directory, you can see that the docker directory I just created is currently owned by the user root and the group root. I want the docker group to have group ownership over this folder, so I'll enter sudo chgrp docker docker. And I want my user to have ownership over the directory instead of the root user, so I'll also enter sudo chown Matthew Docker. Just make sure to change the username of Matthew to whatever username you made. Now the ls command will show that the Docker directory is owned by my user and the group Docker. I'm going to enter the Docker directory and then change the ownership of the portainer directory I just created to Matthew by again entering sudo chown Matthew portainer and then change the group ownership to Docker by entering sudo chgrp docker portainer. Finally, I want to create our first Docker container, which will be Portainer. To create the Portainer container, enter this command. You can copy and paste it from the description of this video, because honestly, it's probably not the easiest to read on the screen right now. The important details about this command is that we are telling Docker to run a command to create a new container. The dash dash name attribute tells Docker what name we want to call it. I personally recommend naming it exactly what it is instead of something clever. Dash p tells docker that we're going to pass in a port into the container. For this container, we want to pass in the ports 8000 and 9000. Everything on the left of the colon is the host information and everything on the right of the colon is the port inside the container. So this command tells docker to pass port 8000 from the host to port 8000 inside the docker container and to do likewise for the port 9000. Dash V tells Docker that we want to pass in a volume. Just like the ports, everything on the left side of the colon is the path on the host and everything on the right side is the path inside the container. We specifically want to pass in the slash var slash run slash docker dot sock socket so that portainer has complete control over docker containers. We also want to pass in the slash docker slash portainer folder on the host and map it to the slash data folder on the portainer container. This lets us store all our configuration files to the host. That way, when we recreate the container to update it, we don't have to reconfigure the container. Dash dash restart equals always tells Docker that we want this container to always restart in case it crashes. And the final line tells Docker the name of the image we want to download to use for this container. When we press enter, Docker checks to see if it's downloaded that image before, and when it sees that it hasn't, it will download the image for us. Once the image is done downloading, I can confirm that Pertainer is working by entering docker logs Pertainer to view the log files for the container named Pertainer, and see it has bound the HTTPS and HTTP server to their respective ports. Since Pertainer is running, let's log into its web interface and configure it for our first time use.
The way Docker works, each Docker container shares the same IP address as the machine running Docker. So to access any port in a container, you enter the IP address of the machine running Docker, followed by colon in the port of that container. You should know the IP address of the Docker virtual machine since we've SSH'd into the machine that Docker is running on right now. But if you ever forget, and assuming you've installed the Quimu guest agent to the VM running Docker, then you can look at the VM summary tab in Proxmox and see its IP address. To open Portainer, we'll open a web browser and in the address bar enter the IP address of our Docker VM, followed by colon 9000. Now, when I was working on this, I got Pertainer up and running, then walked off for a long time, and Pertainer needed to be restarted before I could do my first time configuration. You can easily achieve this by restarting the entire virtual machine running Docker. Alternatively, if you have other containers you don't want to lose access to during a restart, you can log into the VM running Docker and enter Docker Restart Pertainer. The reason I can do this without pseudo privileges is because I've added my username to the Docker group, and the Docker group has ownership over the docker.soc process. Once the pertainer container is restarted, a simple refresh of my web page will bring the first time login screen back up where I can enter a username and password. Now one thing I can't stand about pertainer is they have foolishly long password requirements. This is an IT hill I will die on. Password requirements make it easier to crack passwords as they advertise what has to be in the password. Oh, a password requires a symbol? I can brute force common words swapping out vowels for lead speak then. And long passwords, though technically more secure on paper, end up being so hard to remember that you either lock yourself out of your accounts such that you're forced to use password reset options that are prone to interception, or use the same password across all accounts that you write down on a sticky note and put on your monitor. Oh, I hate it so much! Anyways, put in your password that's at least 12 characters long useless, then click on create user to get going. Optionally, you can deselect allow collection of anonymous statistics if you don't like sharing that kind of data with random companies. Once logged in, the first thing we need to do is set up the IP address of the VM running Docker, which is running Portainer. To do this, click on Get Started. Then, click on the pencil icon way over on the right side of the screen. In this Environment Details screen, enter the IP address of the VM running Docker where it says Public IP, then click on Update Environment. The reason we need to do this is because when we set up containers, it will show all the ports we've passed into that container, including the port to get to the web interface for that software package we're setting up. If you've set the IP address correctly, then clicking on the container's port will open a new tab with the IP address you're entering right now and the port automatically filled in so you can access the web GUI without having to memorize every port. If no IP address is set, it will attempt to open the port on IP address 0.0.0.0, .0, which will obviously fail and cause all kinds of headaches as you try and figure out why things aren't working since you're not paying enough attention to notice it's trying to connect to 0.0.0.0 .0 and you think the web interface isn't working, so you must have set up something wrong. <laughs> or, you know, so I've been told and it's definitely not something I've personally learned in the past. Anyways, with the IP address set, we're done setting up Portainer, and we're ready to make our first container. To create a container within Portainer, open the web GUI, click on the local option, then click where it says container. As you can see, we currently only have the one container, which is Portainer. To add a new container, click on the Add Container button in the upper right hand corner of your screen. The first container I like to set up is Mosquito, spelt with two T's. This is going to be our MQTT broker. It will act as a bridge between our Zigbee devices and Home Assistant. I like starting with this container because it's fairly easy to set up and lets you get familiar with how a pertainer works. Even if you aren't planning on using Zigbee to MQTT, I still recommend getting Mosquito set up since MQTT is such a versatile means of communication in your smart home. I even use it for some Tasmoda devices, despite the fact that Home Assistant can directly communicate with Tasmoda devices. The reason is that in some cases, like with some Martin Jerry fan and light switches, which I highly recommend, there are additional control options and status feedbacks that you can access using MQTT that aren't exposed over the Tasmoda connection. So let's go through the process of deploying a container through Portainer. 
The thing to remember is that everything in Portainer is just a graphical way of configuring the settings that you would enter using the docker compose file or through the docker run command. So, if you find a resource on how to enter the docker run command or how to set up a compose file to deploy a container, you can use that as a reference for configuring it in Portainer. For the name of the docker container, I suggest you just be boring with it and have the name match the software we're setting up. So, for Mosquito, just name it Mosquito with two T's. Next, I like to tell Portainer what image to download for this container. It's okay if you don't know the exact image name. In fact, you're probably not going to know the exact image name. So go ahead and type in the software we're looking for, in this case Mosquito, and then click on the search button. This will pull up Docker Hub's repository listing showing results for the name you just searched for. You can see there are several versions available of Mosquito, and each one will show what CPU architecture that image is compatible with, such as ARM, ARM64, or x86-64. We want the top result of Eclipse-Mosquito. If you click on that entry, it will give you additional details about this image. The first thing we want from this page is to copy the entire name of this image and paste that name into the image box back in Portainer. Make sure to leave the Always Pull the Image option enabled. In the future, when we need to update things, we'll want to pull the latest image instead of reusing the image we already have locally stored on our device. Otherwise, nothing gets updated. Remember that by default, every container is completely isolated from the outside world. So we need to expose the port Mosquito uses for MQTT communications to other devices on our network. Otherwise, no device will be able to reach our MQTT broker. One option for doing this is to toggle on the option to publish all exposed network ports to random host ports. This is a popular container with lots of people using it. So using the default port number does represent a security risk. It's an entirely valid option to let that port number be randomized and to update all guides to use the new random port number instead of the default MQTT port of 1883. On the flip side, depending on the container, it could expose a lot more ports than I would need as there are many features I choose not to use at all, such as exposing the HTTP port when I only plan on using the HTTPS port. There's an old saying that goes something to the tune of, you should never mistake obfuscation for security. That is, just making things random doesn't actually mean the same thing as making them secure. In fact, the National Institute of Standards and Technology specifically speaks against this practice, stating, System security should not depend on the secrecy of the implementation or its components. Or, to put things more bluntly, using an unusual port isn't going to make things more secure inherently. So instead of randomizing the ports we're using, I'm going to manually publish the network ports required using the default port numbers, then I'm going to trust that you take the steps to secure your local network, and together we'll further secure our MQTT broker just in case a bad actor manages to get onto your network anyways. But that comes later. For now, click on publish a new port, and then we'll want to pass port 1883 from the host system into port 1883 on the container. And if you're wondering how I know that, it's because I've set up MQTT quite a lot. But even if this was my first time, I'd know it because I can look at the Docker Hub page for Eclipse Mosquito and see it gives us an example Docker run command. Unfortunately, not every container is as well documented as this one is. In fact, some aren't documented at all on Docker Hub, and you may have to do some searching around on the container's official webpage to figure out how to configure it. Thankfully, Eclipse Mosquito gives us a lot of information and shows that there are three directories, or volumes as Docker likes to call them, that we're going to pass in, and two ports, port 1883 and port 9001. Now port 9001 is if you want to use WebSockets to communicate with Mosquito, so you don't necessarily have to expose that port if you're not going to be using WebSockets with your MQTT broker. Assuming that you do want to use port 9000, you'll need to come back to Portainer and click on Publish a New Network Port again. Then pass in port 9001 from the host to port 9001 of the container. Next, we're going to set up the console to be interactive in TTTY. That's what this dash IT means after Docker run they provide in the example. I know, it's not something you just know by looking at it. With Docker, it's not just an executable that you can click next, 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 next through the entire installation and then everything just works. You're going to have to do a bit of research here and there, but it's worth it. 
We can set the console type importainer on this main tab in the advanced container settings area. Next, let's configure the three directories the Mosquito container wants. Remember, Docker containers work by creating a little sandbox for the image to play in. Once the container is removed, the sandbox and all its contents are removed as well. That's a problem for anyone who doesn't want to reconfigure their entire system every time they update their Docker container. The solution is to pass in, or map, key directories that the container will use to store configuration settings or log files to on the host. When we map a directory, the Docker container will have full access to everything in that directory, so make sure you don't pass in any system directories or files that you don't want the container having access to. What I'd like to do is create a dedicated directory that I will create subfolders in for every container I set up. In fact, we already did this when we installed Portainer. That was the folder we called Docker in our root directory. Since we need to add more directories, SSH back into your Docker VM and go to the Docker folder we created in the root directory. Doing an ls command shows that the only folder we currently have is the Portainer folder. I want to create a new folder for Mosquito to use. To do this, enter mkdir space mosquito, spelt with two Ts. Now the ls command shows our pertainer folder and the newly created mosquito directory, though it shows that it's owned by the Matthew user in the Matthew group. I need a Docker group to have ownership over it, so enter chgrp space docker space mosquito. Enter the mosquito directory and then create the three required directories by issuing the commands mkdir space config, mkdir space data, and mkdir space log. The ls-al command will again show that Matthew has user and group ownership over all three of these directories we just created. So, run the chgrp command for each directory to give the Docker group ownership over each folder as we've done in the past. Before we leave this area, we need to create a config file for Mosquito to use. Enter cd config to enter the config directory we just made, then enter nano space mosquito.conf with mosquito spelled with two t's. This will allow us to edit a new file named mosquito.conf. Copy the information I'm showing on the screen right now from the description area of this video and then paste it into the file by right clicking on the command window. This first line that says persistence true is telling mosquito that we want to keep messages and status information across restarts. The next line tells Mosquito the location we want to store persistent data to is the folder slash mosquito slash data. This folder path is relative to the file structure in the container and not the host. Remember, even though the configuration file is being saved to the host, once we map a directory to that location, the container has no awareness of the host file structure. Everything is going to be relative to the container's system file structure. We then tell Mosquito where to store its logs, and we'll tell it to listen on port 1883 on any network interface. After you get this working, you could change this to explicitly be the IP of the Mosquito container, but you won't really gain any security benefits from doing that unless you're doing a much more complicated network setup in Docker itself. It should also be noted that using port 1883 the way we are is technically the least secure option for MQTT. This is a plain MQTT protocol transmitted unencrypted. You can use the encrypted MQTT protocol, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. I only put it out there so that you can research this if you're in an environment that needs an additional layer of security beyond basic authentication. Now, I did a copy and paste error where I failed to comment out the line that starts with authentication. So comment that line out, but in just a moment I'm going to show you how to troubleshoot this kind of error in case you encounter something like this yourself with one of your containers. In this authentication area, we're going to initially set allow underscore anonymous to true. This lets everything connect to Mosquito and is obviously extremely insecure. We'll only keep it this way to make sure we can initially connect to it, and once it's connected, we'll come back and set this to false. Finally, we're going to put a hashtag symbol in front of the password underscore file line. This tells Mosquito where the list of approved users and passwords is stored, which we'll create in a minute, but for now it doesn't exist, so comment the line out so it doesn't create errors. With this change made, press Ctrl and O to save the file, then Ctrl and X to close out. Now we can actually map those directories into our Mosquito container. Back in Portainer, in the Advanced Container Settings, go to the Volumes tab. 
We're going to map in four volumes in total, so click on the plus map additional icon volume button four times. For each volume, we're going to set the type to bind. Know that for each of these, they list the path relative to the container first, and the second line is the path that exists on the host that we're going to pass into the container. For the first three entries, we'll copy and paste the volume as indicated on the Eclipse Docker Hub page. That's slash mosquito slash config, slash mosquito slash data, and slash mosquito slash log. Remember, spell mosquito with two T's or else the mapping will fail. These are pre-configured folders inside the container image that we're about to deploy and not on our host system. On the host path line, we'll pass in the slash docker slash mosquito slash config slash docker slash mosquito slash data and slash docker slash mosquito slash log. These are the folders we just made on our host system. Now, obviously, if you decide to put these folders in a different location, make sure to change the path here to match what you set up so it will still work. For the fourth entry, we're going to pass in our time zone information from the host into the container to keep everything synced up between the container and host's time. So, enter slash etc slash time zone on both the container and host lines, and then set the entry to be read only. While we want to keep our time information synced up, we don't want the containers messing up the host time zone somehow. Under restart options, set the restart policy to unless stopped. That way, I can manually choose to stop it without Docker trying to start it back up again. With that, everything should be set correctly, so we can press deploy the container. Pertainer will now build the Docker run command for you in the background based on the information you entered, which will have Docker download the latest image for Eclipse-Mosquito and attempt to start it. Now, as long as you didn't make any errors, you should get a success message. If you get a failure message, double check to make sure you entered everything correctly and that Docker has access to the folders you just mapped in. If everything is correct, go ahead and check the documentation and make sure that nothing has changed since I uploaded this video. With Mosquito up and running, we'll want to make sure that Home Assistant can connect to it. So head back to the Home Assistant web interface, then go to the settings area and select devices and services. You can see that for me, Home Assistant has found several devices that I haven't configured yet. I'm going to ignore that for now and click on Add Integration. Search for the MQTT integration, then select it. Now, there are several MQTT options that Home Assistant supports, but the one we want is the plain MQTT option. Here, we'll enter the information to connect to the Mosquito MQTT container we just made. For now, all we have to do is enter the IP address of the machine running Docker and click Submit since we didn't change the port from 1883 and we haven't enabled any security yet. Now, I get a fail to connect message, which is weird since Portainer said Mosquito was running. But if I go back to Portainer, you'll notice that it shows nothing under published ports. If this ever happens to you, you can look at the logs for the container by clicking on the little paper icon in the Quick Actions column for your container. Pulling it up, you can see that it's throwing up an error message saying there's an unknown configuration variable called authentication on line 6 of the comp file. That's because I failed to comment out that line. You already did this, I'm sure, but for me, I just need to go back and edit mosquito.conf by using the command sudo nano mosquito.conf in the docker slash mosquito config directory and put a hashtag in front of the authentication line to comment it out. Then I'll save those changes by pressing Ctrl and O, and then exit out of Nano by pressing Ctrl and X. Now, when I restart the container, I can see I have the two published ports exactly like I expected, and entering my IP address back in Home Assistant allows me to connect to Mosquito, which catches me back up with where everyone else is, I'm sure. Which is great! Let's delete this integration. Click the MQTT integration you just set up, then click on the three dots next to Configure, and select Delete. We're going to set up security for MQTT, and frankly, it's easier to set up fresh from scratch than to try and change things after the fact. To do this, we'll want to issue a command from within the Docker container for Mosquito. We could do this by clicking on the container name in Portainer, and then selecting console, and then connecting to an available option, which in this case would be the slash bin slash sh. But you can't copy and paste when you do it this way, so let me show you a second way you can do it. After SSHing into the Docker VM, enter docker space container space exec space dash it space mosquito 
space slash bin slash sh. Which I know seems a little complicated for being an easier way, but all this command is doing is telling the Docker executable that we want to connect to a container. We're going to do it using IT, which remember is our interactive and TTY mode. We're going to connect to the container that we've named Mosquito, and we want to connect to its bin slash sh prompt. Once you're connected in, enter ls here, and it will show the contents of the container we are connected to rather than the host system. Inside the container, we're going to want to execute the command mosquito underscore passwd space dash c space slash mosquito slash config slash password dot txt space mqtt underscore user. The mosquito underscore passwd is a command that will tell mosquito we want to edit the password information used to connect to it. The dash C attribute tells this command that we want to create a new password. Slash mosquito slash config slash password dot txt tells the command where we want to store the password file we're about to create and mqtt underscore user is a username that we want to create that will be able to connect to mosquito. This command will prompt you to enter a password for the mqtt underscore user that you're creating. There aren't any restrictions on the password as far as I'm aware of, so just make sure not to lose it after you make it. After entering the password, leave the container's environment by typing exit. Then, head back to the slash docker slash mosquito slash conf directory and edit the mosquito.conf file by entering sudo space nano space mosquito.conf. In this file, change the allow underscore anonymous line option to false then uncomment the last line by removing the hashtag in front of password underscore file. Save your changes by pressing Ctrl and O, then exit by pressing Ctrl and X. To get Mosquito to apply these changes, you'll need to restart the Mosquito container. You can either do this in Portainer or here at the command prompt by entering docker restart Mosquito. Once it restarts, go back to Home Assistant and add the MQTT integration again. You'll notice that now if you try to connect without entering a username and password you just set up, you'll get a fail to connect error message. So enter the IP address information, then enter the username and password information and press submit. As long as you've done everything correctly, you'll get a success message and MQTT is completely set up. With Mosquito set up, let's go ahead and move onto Zigbee to MQTT. <laughs> Zigbee to MQTT is a software package that acts as a bridge between all your Zigbee devices and an MQTT server. It allows you to add and remove Zigbee devices, and even allows you to perform over-the-air updates for Zigbee devices provided the manufacturer has made the updates available outside of their own app, which many do thankfully. To set up Zigbee to MQTT, we'll head back to Portainer and click on Add New Container. For the container name, I'll enter Zigbee to MQTT and then search for that same name. Now the Zigbee container image I personally use is this Koenig slash Zigbee to MQTT one. It's not the top hit when searching by name, but if you look at the downloads and stars it's received, it has the highest for both. It also has the widest range of compatible CPU architectures, so this will work regardless of what type of device you're installing it on. Click on that entry and then copy the container's name so that you can paste it back in Portainer. Now I know that I want to publish port 8080, so I'll go ahead and add that port in, but if you look on this entry on Docker Hub, you'll notice that it doesn't have much in the way of information here. Thankfully, they do include a link on how to run this container that is filled with all the information we need. Here on this page, it provides the exact command we would need to create a Zigbee container, except there's a couple things I don't like about it. For example, it uses the variable pwd. This stands for the current working directory for some reason, so it will pass in as a bound volume whatever directory you're currently in to the slash app slash data directory of the container. I much rather prefer to use absolute paths so there's no ambiguity about what I'm mapping in. Also, it's passing in the slash run slash udev directory. This is only needed for auto-detecting the port of some adapters like the Convi Zigbee USB adapter. My current Zigbee USB adapter of choice is a Sonoff 3.0 USB dongle plus gateway, so we don't need to do this. At the time of this video, it costs about $35, which is only a dollar more than I paid for it a couple years ago. Just keep in mind that there is another version of this dongle from Sonoff with almost the exact same name. 
The only difference is that it's called the Plus-E. And that is currently $2 cheaper, but don't get that one. That one came out when there was a chip shortage for the chip used in the non-E version, and it is, in my opinion, a slightly inferior version. Anyways, back to setting up this container. We're going to use what's listed here as a template for our own setup. Under Advanced Container Settings, on the Volumes tab, I'm going to click Map Additional Volumes twice and change it from Volume to Bind. On the second entry, I'm going to map slash etc slash timezone from the container to slash etc slash timezone on the host, and change it to read only just like we did for the mosquito container. Then I'm going to bind slash app slash data from the container to slash docker slash zigbee to mqtt slash data on the host, which doesn't actually exist yet, so let's go make that directory. Back in our remote connection to our docker vm, head to the main docker folder. Running ls space dash al will show us the file permissions and contents of the docker directory so far. If you've been following along with everything in this video, you should have two folders at this point, mosquito and portainer, both of which are owned by the user Matthew and the group docker. Enter mkdir space zigbee to mqtt to create the zigbee to mqtt folder, and then enter chgrp space docker space zigbee to mqtt to change its group ownership to the docker group. Now entering ls space dash al shows all three folders with matching permissions. Enter the newly created zigbee to mqtt folder and type in mkdir space data to create a new directory called data. Then just like always, enter chgrp space docker space data to change its group ownership to the docker group. Now we can come back to Portainer and finish configuring the new Docker container. Under Restart Policy, change the Restart Policy to Unless Stopped. The last step we need to do before deploying the container is to pass in our Zigbee USB dongle. Of course, we haven't actually added our dongle to the Docker VM yet. To do this, we need to go back to our web interface for Proxmox and select our Docker VM. In the hardware area of the VM, click on Add and then select USB Device from the drop-down menu. In the window that pops up, select Use USB Vendor Slash Device ID, and then select the entry for the Sonoff Zigbee 3.0 USB Dongle Plus. Now, unfortunately, Proxmox doesn't allow you to bind USB devices to a VM using their serial ID. Instead, it gives you the option to grab either the entire port, in which case you need to make sure you always plug in the same device at the same port, or it can grab a device based on its vendor and device ID, which is the way we're going to do it. By using the vendor and device ID, it will always map the same device into the same virtual USB port regardless of which physical USB port you plug it into on the host machine. And that works, but my Sonoff Zigbee dongle just so happens to have the exact same vendor and device ID as my Zoo's Z-Wave dongle. So far, this hasn't created any issues for me, and I've been running this for about 18 months now, but it sure does make me nervous. Regardless, choose your Zigbee device and then press Add. As you can see, I've mounted my Z-Wave dongle as well as my Z-Wave dongle. This will immediately mount both of the USB devices to your Docker VM, no need to restart or do anything like that. With the Zigbee dongle now passed inside the Docker VM, it's time to find out what its ID is inside the VM. Go back to your command prompt window where you have SSH'd into the Docker VM and run the command ls space dash l space slash dev slash serial slash by dash id. This will list both my Zigbee and Z-Wave dongles. The part in blue is the part we care about. The blue part is the serial id of this USB device. The part in yellow is where the operating system has mounted it. The reason we're using the serial id is because the serial id will never change, but it's possible that after a reboot, the USB port it's mapped to could swap. Highlight the blue section for the Sonoff device and press enter to copy it, assuming you're using Windows command prompt to SSH into the Docker VM. Then back in Portainer, on the Runtime and Resources tab under Advanced Container Settings, click on Add Devices. Paste the serial ID in the box next to where it says Host, and in the box next to Container, enter slash dev slash tty capital A capital C capital M zero. It's important that you copy and paste the serial ID exactly as it's displayed in the bash prompt or else the container will fail to start after it's deployed, which we're actually ready to do, so scroll up and press deploy the container. 
At this point, we can click on the port 8080 option under Publish Ports and launch the web interface for Zigbee to MQTT. Now, we could just permit join all and start adding devices to our Zigbee network, but let me encourage you to make two quick changes. Under Settings and then Advanced, check the Zigbee channel being used. As you may recall from my wireless standards video, the wireless spectrum Zigbee uses overlaps with the same frequency range as Wi-Fi. We want to make sure to choose a Zigbee channel that isn't going to interfere with your Wi-Fi, and unfortunately, Zigbee doesn't let you change it after adding devices to your network. Or at least it doesn't let you change it without breaking your entire Zigbee network. If you change it after adding other Zigbee devices to your Zigbee network, they will no longer pair with your controller and you will have to re-add in every last Zigbee device from scratch. My personal preference is to use channel 25. Here in the United States, channel 25 overlaps the very high end of Wi-Fi channel 11, such that even if you are using Wi-Fi channel 11, things tend to play nicely with each other. That said, if you know for a fact that you will never use Wi-Fi channel 1 or 6, then choosing a Zigbee channel in that range wouldn't be a bad idea. However, with modern access points dynamically changing what channel they use to relieve congestion in your area, my recommendation is to use Zigbee channels 15, 20, or 25, which exist in the gaps of the main Wi-Fi channels. The second thing I would change in this area is the security key. By default, Zigbee to MQTT uses a known security key, and while it's unlikely the average person is going to face an attack on their Zigbee network, this takes less than a minute to change, so do yourself a favor and change it. Scroll down to where it says Network Key Array and then press the plus sign 16 times, and then choose a number at random between 0 and 255 for each entry. This won't make your network impenetrable, but it's better than leaving it at the default. You don't need to worry about memorizing this key as it is stored, unfortunately, completely unencrypted in plain text in your persistent storage location. Plus, this key is automatically shared with every device that joins your Zigbee network. This is another reason why you don't want to leave permit join on all the time, as then any bad actor can steal your key just by pretending to be a new device wanting to join your Zigbee network. You should only need to make these two changes, but before we continue, in the settings area, click on the Home Assistant integration link and make sure that the drop down box is set to either Home Assistant Simple, with the Home Assistant Simple box checked, or if the drop down box is set to Home Assistant Advanced, that the Home Assistant Discovery topic is set to Home Assistant, all in lowercase and all as one word, that the Home Assistant Legacy Triggers box is checked, and that the Home Assistant status topic is set to HASS slash status. If you don't either have it set to simple or advanced with all the different conditions set correctly, then devices will not automatically show up in Home Assistant. The last time I installed Zigbee to MQTT, it was automatically set to Home Assistant advanced with all the correct settings filled in for me. But I have had some cases where it didn't auto-populate, so just check in on it real quick and save yourself some time and headaches. With those two changes made, and confirming the Home Assistant settings are correct, you can start to add your Zigbee devices. I recommend starting with your Zigbee routers if you need any, which just by way of reminder, tend to be any device powered by main voltages. Not every device powered by main voltages will be a router, but you definitely won't have a battery powered device acting as a router. I personally use a mix of these in-wall Sonoff devices and this off-brand two-gang Zigbee switch modules I got off AliExpress that hide behind my light switches to support my Zigbee network. Of course, in a classic case of do as I say, not as I do, I am going to add in one of these little IKEA trad for Zigbee buttons first. It sits right on my desk next to the Sonoff Zigbee dongle, so it doesn't need a router to connect to, and it's a good test to see if I can get it all the way to Home Assistant. To add it, I press join in Zigbee to MQTT, and then I press the pairing button on my IKEA button three times in quick succession. Now, one thing I've noticed is that it doesn't always add in completely the first time you pair a Zigbee device. This is due to an unfortunate quirk with Zigbee devices. They are, by their very nature, low power devices that turn on briefly and then hibernate. Even when pairing, there's no guarantee it will stay on long enough to finish the pairing process. If this happens, try being patient and giving the device several minutes to pair, to be identified, and to advertise available endpoints to Zigbee to MQTT. If it's not fully discovered even after several minutes, then go through the pairing process again and eventually it will get it. After it's paired, I'm going to edit it and give it a better name than the serial number it has by default, 
so I can actually identify what each device is. On a device with multiple button presses, I also try to note what I plan for each button press to do. Though, inevitably, I end up making changes and forget to update it in ZigBee to MQTT, so that's a thing. After that, I'm going to head over to the logs page by clicking on logs and pressing my newly added button. As long as everything is working correctly, I will see a new log entry for each time I press my button, where it will provide the name of the button pressed along with the payload sent. With it working in ZigBee to MQDT, let's make sure it's detected all the way to Home Assistant. Back in Home Assistant, look at the MQTT integration we made. If done correctly, you should see that there is now one device with some number of entities. Click where it says one device and you'll see a logbook on the right hand side of the screen that will update each time you press a button or flip a switch or whatever it is that your first ZigBee device does. Provided you can see information all the way to Home Assistant, you have successfully set up ZigBee to MQTT and can add the rest of your ZigBee devices. The final Docker container we're going to create is a Z-Wave JS UI container. Now you're going to see me naming this container Z-Wave JS to MQTT because that's what it was called when I first started using it a while back ago. But it got a name change to Z-Wave-JS-UI. I'm sorry for the confusion this causes, but old habits die hard. In Portainer, click on Add Container. For the name, enter Z-Wave-JS-UI and then copy and paste that name into the image box and click on search. Here, you can see that I search for the depreciated image name of Z-Wave.js to MQDT, and clicking on that image name shows a warning message that this image is depreciated and to use the Z-Wave.js UI image instead. I'll click on that link and be brought to the correct image. If you actually search for Z-Wave-JS-UI from the get-go, then the top result of Z-Wave-JS slash Z-Wave-JS-UI is the image you want to select. Like always, copy the entire container name, head back to Portainer, and paste it in the box next to image. Now just like Zigbee to MQTT, there is no documentation for how to configure this Docker container on Docker Hub. There is, thankfully, a link to go to their project's documentation site, so go ahead and click on that. On the documentation site, select the table of contents entry with a label that says using Docker, and we'll be able to use the information here as a reference for building our container. In Portainer, click on publish a new network port twice so we can map in the web GUI port of 8091 and the Z-Wave WebSocket port of 3000. Down in the Advanced Container Settings, we're going to set Console to TTY. In the Volumes area, click Map Additional Volumes twice. Just like the Zigbee to MQTT container, we want to bind the second entry from slash etc slash timezone in the container to slash etc slash timezone on the host and set it to be read-only. On the first entry, we're going to bind the container path of slash usr slash src slash app slash store to the host path of slash docker slash z wave js ui slash store which doesn't actually exist yet so let's go fix that if you don't have an active window where you've ssh into your docker vm get connected then browse to the slash docker folder we created earlier here enter mkdir space z wave js ui to create the folder we'll use with the Z-Wave JS UI container, and change its group ownership to the Docker group by entering chgrp space docker space Z-Wave JS UI. Entering ls space dash al will now show we have four folders, all owned by Matthew, with a group ownership of Docker. Enter the Z-Wave JS UI directory, and then type mkdir space store to create the store directory. Then, like always, change its group ownership to the Docker group by entering chgrp space docker space store. Enter ls space dash al once more to make sure the permissions look correct, and then head back to Portainer. In Portainer, click on the env option under advanced container settings. This container's documentation page lists two environmental variables that we can add if we want to. One is session underscore secret, which I refuse to use until it's properly documented so I know what I'm doing when I use it. I have literally looked all over and there is just no real explanation for what it does. 
There's even a ticket on GitHub where someone asks this outright and no one can answer it. It honestly drives me nuts. What we will be using is the environmental variable zwavejs underscore external underscore config. And we'll put that in the box next to name. And for its value, we're going to enter slash usr slash src slash app slash store slash period config dash db. This will make sure to store our settings in the persistent storage location we've already configured. For the reset policy, we'll set it to unless stopped and under runtime and resources, we'll need to pass in our Z-Wave USB stick the same way we did for our Zigbee USB stick. Now, if you've been following along exactly with this video, you already did this with the Zigbee dongle and you can go through the same process to get your Z-Wave dongle in. But for the benefit of anyone who came directly to the section, here's how to do it. Head back to our web interface for Proxmox and select our Docker VM. In the hardware area of the VM, click on Add and then select USB device from the drop down menu. In the window that pops up, select Use USB Vendor slash Device ID and then select the entry for your Z Wave dongle. For me, this is the Zoo's Z Wave dongle. If you want more information on the difference between using the entire port instead of using the vendor and device ID combination, head back to the Zigbee section where I go into this in detail. After you've selected your Z-Wave device, press Add. As you can see, I have mounted my Zigbee dongle as well as my Z-Wave dongle. This will immediately mount the USB device to your Docker VM, no need to restart or do anything like that. With the Z-Wave dongle now passed inside the Docker VM, it's time to find out what its ID is inside that VM. Go back to your command prompt window where you've SSH'd into the Docker VM and run the command ls space dash l space slash dev slash serial slash by dash id. This will list both my Z-Wave and Zigbee dongles. The part in blue is the part that we care about. It is the serial ID of this USB device. The part in yellow is where the operating system has mounted it. The reason we're using the serial ID is because the serial ID will never change, but it's possible that after a reboot, the USB port it is mapped to could swap around. Highlight the blue section for your Z-Wave device and press enter to copy it. Then back in Portainer, on the Runtime and Resources tab, under Advanced Settings, click on Add Devices. Paste the serial ID in the box next to where it says Host, and in the box next to Container, enter slash dev slash Z-Wave. It's important that you copy and paste the serial ID exactly as it's displayed in the bash prompt or else the container will fail to start after it's deployed. With that, we're ready to deploy the container, so click on Deploy the Container. Once it's deployed, click on port 8091 next to the container's name to open up its web interface. You can agree to share your user statistics or say no to keep that stuff private depending on your own personal preferences here. As long as you pass in your Z-Wave stick correctly to slash dev slash Z-Wave, you can see that Z-Wave.js already shows you as correctly connected to it. To get started in Z-Wave.js, I'm going to click on the gear icon to open the settings and then click on dark mode so I'm not burning my eyes out anymore. Then under the Home Assistant area, I'm going to make sure the MQTT gateway is disabled and that the WS server is enabled. I'll leave the rest on the default this populates to and click on save to apply this change. To integrate this into Home Assistant, I'm going to click on Settings, then Devices and Services, and then click on Add Integration. Search for Z-Wave and click on the entry that says Z-Wave. By default, it's going to prompt you to use the Z-Wave JS Supervisor add-on. Deselect that box since we're using our own Docker container and then press Submit. For the URL, the only thing we want to change is the part that says localhost. Change that part only to the IP address of your VM running Docker, then press Submit. It should immediately give you a success message and any device you add to Z-Wave JS UI in the future will automatically show up here in Home Assistant. Before you add a device, however, in the web interface for Z-Wave JS UI, go to the Z-Wave area and where it shows S2 and S0 authentication, click on the refresh buttons a few times for each of these options to have it automatically create some security keys for you. This is a pre-shared key that will automatically be given to any device that connects to your Z-Wave network, and by hitting refresh a few times, we make sure to cycle it off of any default key that came on the container and onto something unique. You'll want to do this before you start connecting any device, as changing this will break communication with any previously added device, just like it does in Zigbee to MQTT. 
Now, one thing I've just realized is that I've never recorded any footage of me adding a Z-Wave device. I have been running Z-Wave JS all over multiple houses, setting up Z-Wave controllers and devices, and somehow I completely forgot to record a single second of it. So I'm going to delete this outdoor Z-Wave outlet I got last Christmas to control my Christmas lights and add it back in, just for you. With Zigbee to MQTT, removing a device is as easy as clicking on the device icon in the row for that device. Z-Wave devices are a little trickier. If I click on a device I want to remove and then select the menu icon to see what I can do with it, under advanced settings you can see that there is no option to delete the device. Instead, what you need to do is deselect any selected device, or node as Z-Wave calls it, and then click on the menu icon, which you may have noticed went from being green to being blue with no nodes selected. Clicking on this menu icon with nothing selected will give you the option to manage nodes. Select the Exclusion option to remove a device from your Z-Wave network, then click Next. This will set the controller into Exclusion Mode and give you 30 seconds to set your Z-Wave node into Inclusion Mode. I know, it sounds contradictory to put a node into Inclusion to exclude it, but that's just how Z-Wave works. For my outlet, pressing the button on the front of it three times quickly put it in inclusion mode, and Z-Wave JS immediately removed the node from my Z-Wave network. Great! Now I can add it back in. To add a device, go to the menu area and select Manage Nodes. Only this time, I'm going to select the Inclusion option and then press Next. Give your node a name that makes sense and a location if you want to. I'm leaving location blank since this outlet can go anywhere I need it. Fill it in, however, if you want, and then click Next. The next page will ask you how to configure security for this node. Many Z-Wave devices, this outlet included, have the option to scan a QR code that will allow you to automatically add it. However, in my experience, this only works if you're adding a device on your phone. If you try to take a photo of it and then upload it to a computer, it fails, or at least it does for me. It doesn't matter how closely I crop the image, I just can't get it to work. Maybe my hands are too shaky or my lighting is too poor, but for whatever reason, unless I'm on a phone, the only thing that works for me is to leave the default option selected and manually put the device into inclusion mode. So with the default option selected, I'll click next and then put my node back in inclusion mode by pressing the button on the front of it three times quickly. My device was discovered immediately since it is plugged directly into mains voltages. But if you have a battery powered device, it can take a bit to be discovered and several minutes to report all of its functions, just like Zigbee devices. On this screen, you'll be able to select what security level you want for this node based on the options the node actually supports. Personally, I prefer to use the highest security level available regardless of what device I'm setting up, though there are plenty of devices that only offer S0 level security, if they offer anything at all. Usually, you can let the device just do whatever it wants. But, if you get a security device, such as a door lock or a garage door, make absolutely sure that it can do S2 authentication or S0 legacy. You don't want a device that can give access to your home to be completely unsecure. Once you confirm the security level, click on Next, and if this node supports S2 authentication and wasn't added by scanning a QR code, it's going to ask you to verify the security pin on this device. This is usually on the same label as the QR code, or on the device somewhere, and in the manual or the box the node came in. Make sure to store this code somewhere safe in case the label is damaged, so you can keep on using the node long after the sun fades the label into obscurity, or you scuff it up while moving it. After you put in the security pin, click Next. As long as you've entered it correctly, it will show that the node is connected. Now, before we move forward, let's go over two edge case scenarios that you need to be aware of to manage your Z-Wave network. The first is, how do you remove a node that you lose or dies? The proper way to remove a node is to put Z-Wave JS in an exclusion mode and then put the node in inclusion mode. If the node is lost or dies, you can't put the node in inclusion mode, can you? So how do you remove it from your controller? It's actually not too hard. I'll unplug my outlet to simulate it dying or me losing it, and then I'll ping it from Z-Wave.js just so Z-Wave.js will mark it as dead more quickly. Now its status changes from the green check mark to a red frowny face to indicate the device is considered dead. If I expand the node and click on Advanced, you can see that there is an option to remove failed nodes. 
Click Remove and ZWave.js will remove it from your node listing. So that's how to remove a node that you lose or dies, but what if you get a used Z-Wave device? Or, heaven forbid, your Z-Wave USB controller dies and you have to replace it. Z-Wave is designed with security in mind. So if I kick a node off the network or my node thinks it's trying to connect to a brand new controller, it's going to reject the initial inclusion, assuming this is some kind of ID spoofing or man in the middle attack. Here you can see that I follow the same steps as I did previously to add my Z-Wave outlet to my Z-Wave network, but when I put my node in inclusion mode, Z-Wave.js fails to add it. The reason for this is that while I remove the node from Z-Wave.js, my outlet still thinks it's part of the network. This security mismatch causes things to fail. To fix this, we need to first exclude the device from the Z-Wave network. So back out of inclusion mode and go back into manage node, but this time select exclusion. Now I'll put my outlet in inclusion mode. It will see that my Z-Wave controller is in exclusion mode, which will tell it that it needs to remove the previous pairing it had set up. On my outlet, the indicator blinks red at me to let me know that something just happened, though your device may not have any sort of indicator on it. And in Z-Wave.js, the exclusion mode will stop and give you a message that no changes were detected. This is technically true from Z-Wave.js's point of view. As far as it was concerned, the outlet was already deleted out from the network. On the outlet's end, however, the pairing is cleared out and it is ready to be added to a new controller. Now we can enter inclusion mode on Z-Wave.js and add the Z-Wave node just like usual. I hope you're able to follow that. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense to hear it for the first time, but once you do it a couple times, it starts to make more sense. So hopefully you remember this whenever it comes up for you. With our device added, we can run over to Home Assistant and confirm that it's detected and that we can control it in Home Assistant. Just like we did with our Zigbee device, we'll go to the Settings area in Home Assistant, then Devices and Services. Then I'll click on Devices in the Z-Wave integration we configured earlier and select the outdoor outlet I just configured. And here, we can see that I can successfully toggle the device on and off in Home Assistant. So with that, we've done it all! <laughs> Well, we've set up Proxmox and configured it for our basic needs. We've added ISO files to Proxmox and used them to configure VMs. We've imported hard drives to existing VMs and added USB devices to our virtual machines. We've installed Docker and set up Portainer, an MQT broker, Zigbee to MQTT, and Z-Wave JS UI. At this point, we have everything we could possibly want to start setting up a smart home. It cost us around $125 for just the PC and another $35 for each USB dongle. So for just under $200, you have a smart home PC plus the ability to connect to any Wi-Fi, Z-Wave, or Zigbee device you could want. And hey, $200 is not cheap, but it's unrealistic to say that you could do this for $70 with a Raspberry Pi you had lying around. If you had an old laptop lying around, then for $35 you could do everything I just showed you in this video, provided you only needed to use Zigbee or Z-Wave instead of both. And that's what I really like about the method I just showed you. Like I said in the intro, you can adapt this method to any device out there. If you really, really wanted to, you could use two Raspberry Pis, one with Home Assistant and one with Docker, and it would work. This VM method is basically the same thing I did for my Synology NAS and even my TrueNAS server before I switched to Proxmox. And if you don't mind the investment of getting a good low-powered PC like the M715Q to run this on, then $200, while not being what I would call cheap, is also not overly expensive for what you're getting, and it's certainly a much better deal than buying Home Assistant Yellow for $250 that can only run Home Assistant! I will never get past that! Look, no offense to anyone who considers the price tag of Home Assistant Yellow worth it to get a pre-made solution in an attractive little box, but for me, I'd rather save over 50 bucks and I get a system that can do far more. And since this little guy run at a peak power consumption of 20 watts no matter what I threw at it, that means I'm looking at around $25 a year in electrical costs to run this little machine. That's phenomenal, and it's why I wholeheartedly support this little powerhouse. But I support even more looking around on YouTube for other low-powered PCs that might be an even better fit. Because no matter which option you go with, this video will hopefully support you in getting your smart home up and running. And I really do hope this video was helpful to you, because I think every home should be a smart home, and together we can make your home just a bit smarter. Thanks for watching this video. 
If you enjoyed it, please be sure to hit that like button and share it with your friends. If you haven't subscribed yet, I hope you will. And be sure to hit that bell icon to be notified of all the updates I do on this channel. If you want to support the work I'm doing here, then I hope you'll consider becoming one of my Patreons, where you'll get early access to all kinds of videos. And until the next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.